it that when a woman wants to seek entire time spent outside the waters for 20 years with love, with care, with compassion, when they start the process of seeking a divorce for her two years up the religion of Islam is a religion that stands against any form of discrimination. And the laws and the regulations of the Islamic faith in no shape or form contain or support any form of discrimination, whether this discrimination is based on gender, nationality, culture, ethnicity, religion, or school of thought. Similarly, the religion of Islam ensures the rights of all God's creation, including animals, plants, and the wildlife. The Islamic faith ensures the rights of all God's creation equally and specifically the rights of all human beings. The religion of Islam and its laws therefore cannot contain any law that would strip anyone away from their rights. The religion of Islam is a religion that honors and dignifies human beings. And therefore, none of the Islamic laws will then degrade or take the dignity away from any human being in any circumstance. And that is why when it comes to the notion of divorce and specifically for women to seek a divorce in accordance to the Islamic laws, many questions and concerns arise On to what is the explanation or the justification behind the discrimination within the divorce laws between the man and the woman? What do I mean? I mean when a man is trying to divorce his wife, or seek a divorce or a separation from his wife, he does not need to seek her permission. In fact, he can divorce her whenever he wants. By paying her dowry, he can pay her and divorce her and walk away. However, if a woman wants to divorce her husband, then she has to see about 50 scholars and write about 200 letters and wait endless days and nights for her to be granted a divorce. This is, this, this is discrimination. If Islam is there to ensure the rights of all human beings equally, then what happens to the rights of a woman? who no longer can bear being in a marriage with someone who she does not want to live the rest of her life with. There is no attraction, there could be animosity 
from her end towards her husband? What happens to her rights when she wants to seek a legitimate separation? However, on the contrary, if a man dislikes her, his wife, then he can go and marry another wife and keep the first wife. And he can separate from her whenever he wishes. So how is it that here Islam ensures the rights of women in comparison to the rights that the man enjoys within seeking a divorce? What about her dignity and her honor in a marriage where the husband is constantly cursing her, disrespecting her, in some cases even physically abusing her, not fulfilling her needs, whether they are emotional needs or physical needs, dehumanizing her into this marriage, and in return, her dignity and honor is compromised and she is not able to seek divorce. How is it that Islam ensures the dignity? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Holy Quran says, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ We have honored and dignified the children of Adam. What happens to this woman's dignity and honor when she's dehumanized in such a marriage? And that is why you will see today many young women disheartened and living in agony walk away from the religion of Islam and walk away from the Islamic faith. Why? Once they experience discrimination while seeking a divorce. Many of them will leave the Islamic faith. Many of them will be disheartened with the Islamic laws. And to say the least, they will be dischanted with what? With the implication of the Islamic law. As in they'll say, Islam stands for equality. Islam stands for justice, Islam stands for human dignity, but the implication of those laws did not ensure equality, neither my human rights, neither my dignity and my honor. And many of their parents, many of the mothers, and many of the fathers, who have raised their daughters for 20 years with love, with care, with compassion, with respect, marry them to someone who starts mistreating them. Marry them to someone who may look and appear as somebody who is religious, somebody with good mannerism, somebody with good akhlaq. But within a marriage, this person has no akhlaq. In fact, no iman. Why? Because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam says, Do not look at a man and how many rak'ahs of salah he does. And do not look at how many times within the week he, he appears to the masjid. He attends the masjid. Don't look at how many times he's gone to Hajj. Look at the way he is with his family at home. Ahsanukum, ahsanukum li ahlih. The best of you, the most noble of you, the most righteous of you, the most pious of you, is the best one at home with his family, with his wife and children. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam defines iman and kindness and piety on the mannerism of which we, we interact with our family members. Yes, many people outside the home, they are kind, they're gracious. 
they're compassionate, they help others. But when they come home, their akhlaq changes. And they're constantly frowning and treating the home like a bed and breakfast. You know, they come home, they, want, they don't want to talk to anybody. In the morning, they have a shower and breakfast and they leave. The entire time is spent outside the house. And when they are inside the house, they treat this home like a boot camp. Where everyone has to be on alert. God forbid something goes wrong. Then everyone has to be held accountable. Everyone has to be punished. After 20 years, 25 years, those parents marry their daughter whom they've raised with love and compassion and care to someone who mistreats her, who is a zalim. Now they want to seek a divorce for her. When they, when they start the process of seeking a divorce for her, they see more zulm and more injustice and more tyranny taking place in the implementation of Islamic laws of divorce towards their, wife, towards their daughters. Why is it that a divorce... Once a man wants to apply the divorce, then after one session of speaking to a scholar or a counselor, and either the marriage continues or it reaches a separation, an agreement to separate. But why is it that when a woman wants to seek a divorce, one month, two months, three months, a year, two years, I've seen and heard of cases where a woman is trying to grant herself a divorce for four years. Four years. She's literally left the United States and traveled to Iran, to Qom and to Najaf to be granted a divorce. And it's taken her four years of agony and pain. How is it that Islam came to revolutionize the way that people thought of women? People treated women. While women had no value in the Arabian Peninsula, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dedicated the second longest chapter within the Holy Quran, Surah An-Nisa. Recognizing their existence, recognizing their importance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dedicated many chapters in the Qur'an to speak of the affairs of powerful and influential women. Amongst them was Surah Maryam. Why is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses to give the title of Surah Maryam for a chapter that was revealed in the holy city of Mecca? 1,400 years ago, why? To speak of the story of Maryam. To tell the Muslim woman that if you're going through agony, if you're going through pain, if you're going through discrimination, if you're going through accusation, Maryam, Maryam ibn Imran, the purest woman, the most noble woman was also accused. If, you're, if they are fighting you today, they were fighting Maryam as well. To inspire them, to encourage them. How is it that this Islam, its laws once being implemented, would be so unjust towards women? And the month of Ramadan, brothers and sisters, and spending time with the Holy Quran must change that. We seek reform and we seek change within our communities through the Holy Quran. Because this book is the book of guidance. Amir al-Mu'mineen wa Mawla al-Muwahideen salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. Says this book is the best of advisors. Describing the Quran. 
He says, this Qur'an is the best of advisors. It's a friend that never lies. It's a guide that never cheats. And then he says, no one, no one will spend time with the Qur'an unless they depart with an increase and a decrease. And I told you about this. An increase in knowledge, an increase in awareness, an increase in wisdom, an increase in certainty and a decrease in ignorance, in confusion, uncertainty. This is the change that the Qur'an is ought to bring to us in the month of Ramadan. A change of how we study and teach and implement our Islamic laws. What do I mean? I mean today, if somebody wants to study Islamic law, and if I am here to teach Islamic law, I begin with telling you how to implement the law. So let's begin with wudu, ghus, salah, tayammum. I begin to tell you how to implement the law. However, you know the most effective ways to communicate with human beings is not to first introduce the law to them. It's to speak of the results. That's why if you see advertisements today, the ad doesn't tell you what to do first. The ad asks you, do you want to own your home? Do you want to pay off your debts? Do you want to live debt free? And then somebody's tossing away the credit cards. Or somebody's behind this beautiful brand new house. Do you want to own your own business? And then somebody's you know, sitting behind the laptop and they're in a, in a nice office. Then when they get your attention, then they start telling you what to do to order, in order to own a home, in order to pay off your credit cards in order to drive the vehicle you like. Let us go to the Qur'an. The ayah is in chapter Surah Al-Saf, verse number 10. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks the following question. يا أيها الذين آمنوا O you believers You O you mu'mineen يا أيها الذين آمنوا هل أدلكم Shall I teach you and guide you على تجارة To a transaction To a business تنجيكم من عذاب أليم That will give you salvation From my great punishment Allah asks us in the Quran O you believers should I direct you and inform you and tell you of a business between me and you that will rescue you from my punishment? The answer is yes. Oh Allah, please teach us. Then he tells us. Rasulullah would, would sit with his companions. He says, should I teach you a salah that's going to forgive your sins? Yes, Ya Rasulullah, tell us. Should I teach you of an amal that's going to be an equivalent of paying charity? As large as giving away gold equivalent to the mountain of Abu Qubais? Yes, Ya Rasulullah, tell us. Should I tell you of an act that's going to forgive your sins, bring harmony within your family? And then people would say, Yes, Ya Rasulullah, tell us, inform us. On the contrary, Allah and Rasulullah would also speak. Of things that would bring punishment. Should I tell you of an act? That if you were to do it, Allah will erase all your good deeds? Of course, we want to know. We don't want our deeds to be erased. Should I tell you of an act that if you were to engage in it, Allah will shift your good deeds and give them to someone else? Of course, Ya Rasulullah, we want to know that Rasulullah would tell them, if you do the ghiba of another human being, Allah will take your good deeds and give it to them. 
If you accuse someone, Allah will take away your good deeds and give it to them. Take away from their bad deeds and put it in your records. Rasulullah would tell us, Do you want me to inform you of such things? People would ask, then he says yes. Today when we teach fiqh, we begin with the law. This is how you do salah. This is how you do wudu. But what is the purpose behind wudu? What is the philosophy behind wudu? What is the philosophy behind salah? It's something that is rarely discussed. That's why I get so many emails of people asking me, say that every morning we take a shower, a full shower. Why do we need to do wudu? If wudu is for me to cleanse myself, I take a shower every morning. Why waste more water? Wudu was for people who at that time worked on the fields. And they were dirty and they were sweating. But now we have the colognes and the perfumes and the deodorant. Why do we need to keep on wasting water with wudu? Obviously people are willing to waste water in any sort of way. But when it comes to wudu, it's a waste of water. <laughs> They're willing to take any sort of vacation anywhere in the world. But when you tell him to go back to Hajj, but I've already gone. This is Israf. I shouldn't go back. Tell him to go to Cancun, he's there tomorrow. But tell him to go to Karbala, I've already gone. Alhamdulillah, I've done my ziyarah. But regardless, what is the philosophy behind wudu? If I don't understand the philosophy behind wudu and I don't teach the philosophy behind wudu, then I am teaching that on the contrary of the methodology of the Quran of Rasulullah. When I understand that when I wash my face the first time, I say, Allah, forgive the sins of my eyes and my face and my ears and my tongue. And the second time, oh Allah, enable my eyes, my ears, my tongue to speak and to do that which seeks your pleasure and satisfaction. I understand what is the philosophy behind washing my face. Oh Allah, when I wash my hands, forgive the sins of my hand. The second time, enable this hand to do that which pleases you. From head to toe, O oh Allah, when I wipe my head and I wipe my toes, from head to toe, I belong to you. When I watch, when I wipe my feet, O oh Allah, allow those feet to walk straight on Salat al Mustaqim, on the Day of Judgment. When I remind myself at least three times a day with the philosophy of wudu while I'm doing wudu, you better believe my sins will become less. And I will prepare myself mentally and emotionally for the salah. That is why Ramadan should come with a spirit of change. Change in how we teach and how we study fiqh. And it also should come with the spirit of bringing change within our communities and our lives and our families. If there are issues within our community, within our family that are driving away people from faith, that are driving people away from the religion of Islam, that what we ought to do is we ought to bring this perfection to them. Change them. Re-evaluate them. Discuss them. And like I said, one of the areas that truly needs reform, truly needs change, is the methodology in which a man can divorce his wife, and a woman can seek divorce. As in, it shouldn't be as easy as one, two, three for a man to divorce his wife and leave her on the streets after 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 6 months, I don't care how long. For him to just keep on divorcing one, marrying another one, divorce another one, marry another one, divorce another one, marry another one. And play with the emotional lives of individuals. 
That should be unacceptable. And similarly, if a woman wants to be in a marriage with someone else, she does not want to be in a marriage with this particular person, then she should be given the chance to separate from this man and live her life freely. Let us come to verse number 2, chapter 2, verse 229. The verse starts with saying At-talaq marratan At-talaq What is talaq? Divorce Separation Which, What does talaq mean in Islam? According to Islamic terminology What does it mean? Because I see some people For marriage for example He says let me introduce my wife to you So I said okay when did you get married? He says no we're not married we're engaged what does this engage, engagement mean, brother? Does it mean you've done aqd of nikah? Yes, it does. She's your wife. Islamically, she is now your wife. Brother, what does this engagement mean? Oh, we've just spoken. Our families have spoken. We're, get to know, we're getting to know each other. Brother, she's foreign to you. She's somebody you're getting to know for marriage. But there is no contract, formal contract between you. That is the definition of marriage in Islam. Don't confuse those definitions. Some people go and they speak, to, two families speak to each other. And then to bless this gathering and to bless the couples, they read Surah Al-Fatiha. There's nothing wrong with reading Surah Al-Fatiha, but Surah Al-Fatiha does not entail that you become husband and wife. Or now you can, for example, do things that foreign men and, and women can do. You can't. What's divorce according to Islamic law? I don't like my husband anymore. But that doesn't mean you're divorced. No, I'm divorced. I, I divorced him myself in my heart. I divorced him. Doesn't mean you're divorced. You tell her, you tell the man, what? where's your wife? Oh, I divorced her. Did you divorce her? Well, you know, we're not talking anymore. That doesn't mean you've divorced her. That just means you're angry at each other. So what is divorce? Divorce is when, according to the school of Ahlul Bayt, a woman is divorced while she cannot be on her menstrual cycle and she's divorced after a menstrual cycle is over in which her and her husband did not have intimacy. So a month passes, she's not been intimate. They have not been intimate. There is a menstrual cycle. After the menstrual cycle, this divorce may be valid. With a valid contract. Just like you need a contract, a formal mannerism in marriage, you need a formal mannerism in conducting a divorce. The first type of divorce is what? The, irrevoc the revocable divorce, the returnable divorce. You divorce, you may go back to your spouse. In this process of divorce, a husband may return to his wife, a wife may return to her husband, she lives at his home. She does not need to wear hijab from him. In fact, the scholars say that it's good for her to beautify herself in that moment. It's very funny because someone came and told me, say it, you know, my wife never used to beautify herself at home. I mean, you know, doing her hair and makeup and wearing nice clothes and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, wearing perfume. Not smelling like curry and... But as soon as I did the divorce, the Islamic law says that she has to live at home. And I'm seeing there's somebody completely different. You know, the way she dresses, the way she... So the scholars say it's actually recommended for women to beautify themselves in such an occasion. Why? So then the family will be reunited. Because Islam does not encourage divorce. Islam does not 
um, encourage separation and the breaking of families. So the first kind of divorce is the returnable divorce, the revocable divorce, where a husband can return to his wife the first time, the second time. After the third time, he no longer can return to her. That's the first kind. Another kind is a marriage of those two people who their marriage did not fully take place. After that divorce, she does not need a idda. And if he wants to return to her, then he needs a new contract, a new dowry. There are other scenarios. However, then we have the second form of divorce, what we're discussing now, the irrevocable divorce. A divorce where the husband can no longer go back to his wife. Once this divorce is done, he cannot return to her. And that is the kind of divorce where the, the wife dislikes her husband. Listen to me. She dislikes him. But why does she dislike him? Why do you care why she dislikes him? How come if he dislikes her, we don't ask for an explanation? She dislikes him. She does not see herself living with him. She no longer bears him. There is no attraction. There is no emotion. There is no love. There is hate. She can't stand him. How can, how can she live with him? Yes, sometimes there's disagreements. There's disagreements. The husband has disagreements with his wife. So he exercised sabr and patience. And that's what Rasulullah did with Zayd and Zainab bin Jahsh. They came to him, Ya Rasulullah, we don't want this marriage. We want to separate. Rasulullah says, no, please stay. Remain married. Marriage is not easy. They come again and again and again. And Rasulullah encouraged them to remain married. Obviously, that's the teaching of Islam. That is the teaching of Islam. Not the first time you know you go for counseling. Don't waste your time. Just go get, get, get a divorce. Get it over with. That's not Islam. Islam encourages that people live amongst each other. They protect their families, their children, the union of family. But sometimes it is impossible. It's impossible for you to live in agony, in pain, in misery. So then the solution becomes what? Divorce. Sometimes divorce is the most disliked act in the religion of Islam. This is the teaching of Rasulullah. The most disliked act in the religion of Islam. When there is no reason. When two people are just separating, when they can still remain together. When they can still live together. When they're separating because of reasons that have no justification. Upstairs please. That is when divorce is something that is disliked. Listen to me. But if in this divorce somebody's being abused, whether it's the husband or the wife, somebody's being abused, they're being dehumanized, their rights are taken away from them, they're living in agony, they may be physically abused, then believe me, this divorce is liked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah does not want to see people suffer. Their whole life suffer. Their children will suffer. So the second is when a wife dislikes her husband. She hates him. She cannot bear him. She says, I give up my dowry in order to get my divorce. Why was this verse revealed? This verse was revealed when a woman came to Rasulullah. Ya Rasulullah, listen to me. I dislike my husband. Her name was Jamila bint Abdullah. Go read about her in history. She was a pious woman, a righteous woman. She came to Rasulullah. Ya Rasulullah, I dislike my husband. I cannot bear him. I cannot stand him. She says, yesterday, she's, this is what she says to the Prophet. Yesterday I saw him amongst a group of men. And I saw him to be the least attractive one. Ya Rasulullah. Then she adds, Ya Rasulullah, please do not allow me to go back to kufr after my iman. Allahu Akbar. 
This is what we're doing sometimes. We're driving those young women to kufr after their iman. Ya Rasulullah, do not allow me to go to kufr after my iman and to commit the cardinal sins. Grant me my divorce. Rasulullah says, what was your dowry? She says, my dowry was a piece of land. He says, return the piece of land to your husband and you shall be divorced. Just like sometimes the husband has to pay the full dowry to divorce his wife, Islam establishes equality and says, if the wife seeks the divorce, repay your full, full dowry and seek your divorce. This is called Talaq al Khul'i. So let's go to the verse in the Quran. Talaq marratan, like I said, you divorce two, two times. After the third time, it is an invalid divorce. فَإِمْسَاكُمْ بِمَعْرُوفِ Either you hold on to this marriage, to this family, with ma'roof, with treating them, treating one another, with respect, with dignity and honor, preserving the honor and dignity, <laughs> sanctifying the honor and dignity of both individuals in this marriage, and this contract. Because a contract works both ways. One side is the man, one side is the woman. The woman shows respect, the husband shows respect. Both of them live under a roof with mutual understanding. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَإِمْسَاكٌ بِمَعْرُوفٍ you, you hold on to each other with respect and dignity and love and compassion. أَوْ تَسْرِيحٌ بإحسان, Or you separate from one another. Not with a war, not with fights, but with ihsan, with doing good deeds. Let it be a good breakup. وَلَا يَحِلُّ لَكُمْ Now Allah makes an extremely important point here. وَلَا يَحِلُّ لَكُمْ أَن تَأْخُذُوا مِمَّا آتَيْتُمُوهُنَّ شَيْئًا And you cannot take back the dowry that you have given them. The clothes that you have given them, the jewelry that you have given them, the money that you have given them. Because I know some men in the time of divorce, he says, well, give me everything that I've given you. What do you mean? She lived with you for five years. Even the clothes that I bought for you, the shoes that I got for you, everything that I got for you, give it back to me. What are you going to do with them anyways? Is this the etiquette of a Muslim? Is this the akhlaq of a person that follows the Qur'an of Rasulullah? How is it that talaq al-raj'i becomes wajib or mustahab, becomes makruh and becomes haram? Let me explain this and with this we conclude. The irrevocable divorce, sometimes it is mubah, allowed. When? When your, when your wife comes and tells you, divorce me, I dislike you, I don't want to live with you. Smubah, you're allowed, you divorce her. She gives up her dowry and there is a divorce and there is a mutual agreement and a separation like two normal human beings. It becomes mustahab recommended according to some scholars wajib. When? Listen to this. When there is suspicion of disloyalty, when you've heard when you've seen, when you suspect disloyalty, divorce her, it's mustahab. Some scholars say it's wajib for you to divorce her. Don't keep this marriage. Don't let things get worse than already what they already are. So it becomes recommended. Some people would think, no, what's recommended is other than, you know, the, the exact opposite. Where, you know, you go to war and you start, you know, exposing one another and there is courts and there is... Police coming to the house every single day? No. What's recommended according to the scholars of tafsir is if you feel and suspect disloyalty, break the marriage. And third becomes haram according to what the ayah is saying. When? When you say, I want to divorce her, there's no problem. I want to divorce her, but I'm not going to divorce her. Unless she says the words. What are the magic words? I don't want my dowry. As soon as she says, I don't want my dowry, okay, I'll divorce you. 
this money of that dowry becomes then haram. According to all the maraj, all the fuqaha, all the scholars, it is haram to consume that money. It is haram to take that money. In fact, if somebody after 10 years, he does tawbah and goes to hajj and asks for repentance, his repentance is not accepted unless he calls his ex-wife and says, give me your bank account. So I wire for you your mahar, your dowry. Whether it was $1,000, $5,000, $10,000, I don't understand. I don't know how much it was. Or reconcile, say, look, I cannot pay the whole thing. I can pay you half of it. But as long as you're content, and in the day of judgment, you don't hold me responsible. So Allah in this ayah says, وَلَا يَحِلُّ لَكُمْ أَن تَأْخُذُوا مِمَّا آتَيْتُمُوهُنَّ شَيْئًا You cannot take back their dowry. إِلَّا أَن يَخَافَ أَن لَا يُقِيمَ حُدُودَ اللَّهِ Unless they fear that they fall into sin, what we discussed, the woman. Then it is allowed for you to return the dowry, to take the dowry, and then Allah in the end of the verse, read the end of the verse, وَمَن يَتَعَدَّ حُدُودَ اللَّهِ And the, those who transgress on the laws of Allah, those who play, break the laws of Allah, فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الظَّالِمُونَ Then they are the ظَالِم, they are the ones practicing and indulging into ظُلْم. وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ ورحمة الله